Hi, um, my name is Sophie Dixon and I'll be delivering the lecture today on what makes a criminal. So we'll be discussing the various factors that contribute um, to increasing the likelihood of somebody involving themselves in criminality. Um, I'm a PhD student in the Institute of Criminology um, and currently my research topic is on child sexual exploitation networks, but we won't be covering any of that today. Um, prior to um, my postgraduate studies, however, I studied um, psychology um, for my undergraduate degree and this will be the main discipline we'll be drawing on in this session. But before that, I'm just going to give you a brief idea of what criminology is about. So, criminology is a study of crimes. It's a study of the causes of crimes, the effects of crimes, and the social impact of crimes. Um, so, you're coming at criminality basically from all different angles. Um, and it's my job, or a criminologist's job, um, to look at the situation, analyse the data, and ask why the crime was committed and try and use that information to predict and prevent further criminal behaviour. Um, so from that, you can probably tell, because of all the angles that we're looking at it from, it's a multidisciplinary subject. Um, so this means it involves psychology, which is more about why somebody commits a crime, um, sociology, which would be the social impact of the criminal activity, and even philosophy, so is a criminal responsible for their actions? Um, and then, of course, it involves lots of different practitioners. So you've got police with detection and prevention, um, the government around policies um, and prison services when it comes to things like rehabilitation and punishment. Um, today, however, as I said, we're going to be mainly focusing on what makes somebody more likely to commit crimes. Um, and that is going to be focused on psychology. But we will be covering um, the nature-nurture debate, which hopefully you're a little bit familiar with, but if not, it's not a problem. Um, and then we will be looking at the various inherited influences on criminality and the various environmental influences on criminality. Um, and following this, we will, there will be a short um, discussion on what we found out and how that might impact future policy. So the nature-nurture debate is one of the oldest debates um, in psychology and sits very centrally um, in psychology as a discipline. Um, so this debate um, is about the extent to which a particular trait in a person or is a product of the environment or is a product of genetics. So nature being the things that are acquired by genetics or hereditary influence and nurture being things that are influenced by the environment that we live in. Now, we're well past the stage of arguing completely for one side or the other. And I mean, the fact that it's called the nature versus nurture debate um, does kind of indicate that it's um, one thing staunchly against the other. But that's not the case. Um, we're at a stage where what we're looking at is how much one contributes to a particular thing compared to the other, fully accepting that nature and nurture have a role to play in most things. So here we have a list of characteristics and traits in people um, and we can look at how much they are based on inherited um, factors and how much they are based on environmental factors. Um, so first, if we look at eye colour, um, we know that eye colour is entirely determined by your genetics. Um, this is a rare exception. There is no half and half, there is no a little bit of one, a little bit of the other. This is entirely based on your genetics. Um, similarly, in the other direction, we have taste and fashion. So fashion is based on the environment you're in. You do not have a gene for fashion. And that is why you see how much fashion changes over time and between cultures. Um, so these are what we would call a more rare exception. The others um, are much more mixed and you have to try and determine how much is contributed by genes and how much is contributed to by the environment. Um, so looking at height, for example, um, height you might think is much more influenced by genetics and it is, there is a big genetic component to your height. However, if you were malnourished, for example, and did not get all of the nutrients that you required, you might not reach your full height potential. 
Um, again, we can look at IQ as a good example. Now, IQ is one of the hotly debated topics um, when it comes to the nature nurture debate and how much of somebody's IQ or intelligence is based on the environment they're in um, and the learning they receive and how much is based on their genetics and what they have inherited. Um, so the question that you have to ask now is why do we care? Why does it matter if something is inherited or something is environmentally determined? What difference does it make to us? And the answer to that is, if we know how something has come about, a trait in a person or a characteristic in a person, and why, how it's been determined, that allows us to not only understand it more, but to understand how we might be able to manipulate those characteristics and manipulate those traits. So, for example, if we learned that IQ was much more based on an environmental impact than on an inherited impact, then that might change the way that we tackle schooling. Um, the approaches we take, how we split children into um, ability bases, etc. cetera. Um, so understanding the origin of these traits is important in that sense. So we're going to start with inherited traits. Um, and this is just a bit of a case study uh, to give you an idea of how criminality can pass through generations independently of a shared environment. Um, so this case study uses adoption studies. Um, an adoption study is an excellent way of disentangling nature and nurture because you, it allows you to look at parent and child and see that whilst they share the same genes, they'll share a completely different environmental setup. Um, and that allows you to see that commonalities between them are most likely due to a shared um, set of genes. So in this case, we had Jeffrey Landrigan. Um, so he was adopted at birth. Um, into a middle-class professional family. Um, but he had a troubled childhood. His behaviour um, got worse and worse as he aged. Um, he was abusing drugs and alcohol at 10 years old, and then he was arrested for burglary, drug abuse, and eventually he killed his first victim at 20 years old. So while he was on death row in Arizona, um, he struck up a friendship with a man called Darren Hill. He was another inmate on death row in Arkansas. Um, and it transpired um, that Hill recognised um, Jeffrey Landrigan, having never met him, however. Um, and he wondered why he felt that he knew this man. Um, it transpired um, that Hill had previously known Landrigan's biological father, who was also on death row. Um, and it also transpires from there that um, Landrigan's father um, also was the child of a man who had previously um, been in prison for his most of his life. Um, so here we have three generations of men that have all been um, imprisoned for violent crimes, two of them being on death row for murder, um, and yet two of them had never met each other. Um, they had been raised completely in different environments. So this would suggest that what we're seeing is some, some kind of inheritance of particular factors and traits. So in this lecture, we're going to just look at two um, inherited traits that are thought to contribute to criminality. Um, one will be about the monoamine oxidase A gene, and one will be about the activity in the prefrontal cortex. So we'll start with the monoamine oxidase A gene. Um, forgive me if I get a bit tongue twisted um, because it's a hard one to keep saying. Um, but the MAOA gene um, is a gene that produces an enzyme that breaks down certain chemicals that are used to send messages in the brain. Um, so they can be serotonin and dopamine, the chemicals that they break down. Um, so it sounds complicated, but it's really not. You have a gene, it produces an enzyme, and that enzyme is used to break down certain chemicals. So 
While everybody has a monoamine oxidase A gene, um, some people have genes that have a higher level of activity than others, and some people have a gene that has a lower level of activity than others. Um, those that have a low activity MAOA gene um, will produce less of the enzyme that is used to break down those neurochemicals. Um, so this means that there is a higher level of serotonin and dopamine left in the brain. Um, and higher levels of serotonin and dopamine leads to a higher level of impulsive and violent behaviour. Therefore, people that have a lower activity MAOA gene are more likely to have higher levels of violence and aggression. Um, so here we can see some real world application of these findings about the MAOA gene. Um, so this here is a news article um, about um, a man that appealed a sentence um, based on um, behavioural genetics. Um, so in this case, which was in 2009, um, a man, Mr. Bayout, admitted to stabbing and killing somebody after he had argued with them. Um, however, during the appeal, they found a number of abnormalities in brain imaging scans and in five genes that have been linked to violent behaviour, including the MAOA gene. Um, so an Italian court cut the sentence given to the convicted murderer by a year because he had genes linked to violent behaviour. Um, this was the first time that behavioural genetics has affected a sentence passed by a European court. Um, so it was quite a landmark moment. Um, but yes, he had a number of genes that were linked to violent behaviour, one of which was the gene that we were just talking about, the monoamine oxidase A gene. Um, this would be a good point as well to put in a small disclaimer. Um, there are many people in the population that have a low activity MAOA gene. It is not just found amongst those that end up in prison or commit violent crimes. It's something that you will find many of you watching this video may also have. Um, having that gene is not going to be the thing that makes you more likely, um, is not going to be the thing that, that makes you a murderer or commit a violent crime. These are incremental differences um, that increase likelihood of aggressive or violent behaviour. It's when you get these factors interacting with other factors that link in with criminality that you will see a larger increase in somebody's potential. Next we'll be turning to look at um, brain activity in the prefrontal cortex. Um, so just to give you an idea, um, in the diagram there of the brain, um, the area in purple is the prefrontal cortex. So it is this part of the brain that sits right here at the front of the head um, that is the prefrontal cortex. Um, and this area of the brain is responsible for lots of important things. Um, this includes decision making, um, your impulse control, um, your ability to empathise with other people, your ability to regulate your emotions and also your cognitive flexibility. So that's your ability to switch your way of thinking or switch from diff into different tasks. Um, so the prefrontal cortex is very important and especially you can see here things like emotional regulation, empathy, decision making, really important when it comes to things like crime. So here we have a PET scan um, for two different groups, a control group and a group that have been sentenced and um, convicted of murder. Um, so a PET scan or positron emission tomography is a functional imaging technique um, and it uses radioactive tracers so that you can visualise changes in the metabolic process. Um, this is things like blood flow. Um, so the amount of blood that goes to a particular area of the brain is indicative of how much um, activity is going on in that area of the brain. So if you're using a particular section of the brain, there will be a higher level of blood flow in that area. And the PET scan shows this in images like, as you can see before you, the controls and the murderer group. So in this study, 22 people um, that were in prison for murder um, and 22 individuals that had um, no convictions for murder or any kind of violent crime, um, but were the same age and same sex as the murderers, um, were 
given PET scans. Um, during this scan, they were asked to complete a continuous performance task that required sustained attention. So this ensured that the prefrontal cortex should have been activated by this activity. Um, and then the activity was monitored. Um, you can see quite clearly here um, that in the controls, um, there's quite a high level of activity at the front of the brain here. It's um, activated in red, which shows a high level of blood flow. Um, in contrast, in the murderer group, you see a very low level of activity in the prefrontal cortex. Um, so this indicates that there is dysfunction in the prefrontal cortex in those that are um, demonstrating violent criminal activity. Um, so the prefrontal cortex we saw earlier was really important for things like um, one's ability to empathise, one's ability to control their impulses, um, control their emotions. Um, so you can see how this would um, could lead somebody into trouble when it comes to um, a violent interaction um, if they are limited in their ability to do those things because of the lack of activity. Um, these kind of deficits um, could occur through environmental influence or through genetic influence, um, even though it's a biological marker. Um, we could see this kind of disruption to neural activity take place through traumatic brain injury, for example. And there is a much higher level of traumatic brain injury amongst the prison population than there is in the general population, which demonstrates that this um, could be a cause. Um, however, there is also indication that this kind of dysfunction can be detected in very early development, um, even neurological dysfunctions taking place um, when um, you are examining um, a fetus in utero, um, which suggests that not only can it occur through an environmental impact, but it can also occur through neurological um, disruption um, and a genetic inherited um, dysfunction. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at environmental factors um, that impact um, the likelihood of one becoming involved in criminality. Um, so there are a number of different things. Um, they've got fetal alcohol syndrome, childhood maltreatment and deviant peers. And they're the factors that we're going to look at in this presentation. But just for a bit more um, background information, there are lots of other environmental factors that can impact criminality. And that includes things like poverty, um, poor maternal attachments, head traumas, which we discussed just earlier when it came to um, disruption of prefrontal cortex activity, um, and birthing complications. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many, many factors that can have an impact. But as I said, the ones in red are the ones that we're going to cover in this lecture today. So we're going to start off by looking at childhood maltreatment. Um, so there are different categories of childhood maltreatment. You have physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse and neglect. Um, the majority of maltreated, maltreated children, sorry, however, will suffer from more than one kind of abuse, um, often a combination of the four that we've just mentioned. So childhood maltreatment is associated with poor mental health and elevated delinquent behaviours. Um, so somebody that has experienced um, the various types of abuse that we talked about in the last slide um, is much more likely to experience depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, but also things such as conduct disorder, personality disorders and substance abuse problems. Um, conduct disorder in particular is highly, highly associated um, with criminal behaviour um, and this is often the label that is used in childhood um, but which turns into a label of antisocial behaviour disorder or even psychopathy in adulthood. So the question that we have to ask ourselves next is why does childhood maltreatment, such as physical abuse, emotional abuse, etc., that we discussed earlier, um, lead to disorders such as conduct disorder or substance abuse problems, etc., which leads to increases in violent and aggressive behaviour and increased participation in criminality? Well, there is more than one answer, um, one of which 
that isn't on this side um, is through learned behavior, learning from parents. So if you experience um, a childhood um, that is dominated by violence and aggression, then that is something that you might learn as a coping mechanism and also as a way to deal with problems um, and life later on. Um, so simply learning um, through those around you. That is one explanation. Um, but there is a more complicated explanation, um, which is based on epigenetics. Um, so this is where you will see nature and nurture really entangling with one another and making it really difficult to see where these things are actually coming from. Um, so children that are experiencing um, maltreatment um, will be exposed to level sustained levels of stress, high levels of stress throughout their childhood. Um, experiencing this influences the expression of some of our genes. Um, so being under a high level of stress might make certain genes be um, have a higher activity or a lower activity as we discussed with the MAOA gene. Um, so while we're all born with a set of genes that have pre been predetermined, um, how they're expressed can be influenced by our environment. Um, so if a child is being maltreated, they have high levels of stress for prolonged periods of time, that will influence the level of activity or the level of expression of particular genes, and then how these genes are then being expressed will influence the way our brains function, in turn, making a change in how we behave. Um, so in cases of childhood maltreatment, although it's an environmental factor um, that is at play, um, the way that it actually affects individuals can become biological even to um, a genetic level. Um, and this is why the nature-nurture debate is so complicated um, and why it's so hard to disentangle um, the two things. Um, but epigenetics is a fascinating area of study, um, trying to understand how even our genes can be altered by the environment. Um, it's a very complicated area, um, but very interesting. And this childhood maltreatment um, is one way in which epigenetics can work when it comes to criminality. So again, this slide is just to give um, the information I've given you a bit more real world context. Um, so here um, we have um, just a small case study on Charles Manson and Arlene Wernos. So these both notorious serial killers um, a while back. Um, so you've probably heard of at least Charles Manson. Um, so he was the leader of a cult that committed a total of nine murders. Um, and he had a terrible um, childhood. Um, he was neglected by his mother. Um, his mother was a severe alcoholic um, and he was sold um, by her various times um, for alcohol. Um, so he experienced quite a lot of childhood maltreatment. And the same can be said for Arlene Wernos. Um, she was a serial killer. Um, who killed six men along a Florida highway. She tended um, to kill men that were seeking her services as a prostitute. Um, again, she had an awful childhood. Um, her father had committed suicide whilst he was in prison um, and he had been convicted for childhood molestation. Um, she herself was sexually abused um, by the grandfather, um, physically abused by her grandmother and abandoned by her mother. So she experienced a lot of maltreatment, um, sexual, physical, emotional. Um, so here we're seeing um, two case studies where um, they had the risk factors that we were previously talking about with childhood maltreatment and did go on to commit um, criminality. That's not to say that this was the only thing that led to their criminality. There would have been many, many other factors at play. Um, and there are many people that experience um, terrible childhood maltreatment, but don't go on to commit any kind of criminality. Um, so as I was saying before, um, these things um, contribute incrementally, um, but with various interactions and with the presence of other factors can end up having a much larger impact. Okay, now we are going to take a look at fetal alcohol syndrome. 
Um, so this is a syndrome that is developed due to a significant exposure to alcohol during pregnancy. Um, again, this is a um, biological disorder um, that occurs through environmental factors. So through the consumption of a mother, a mother consuming alcohol during pregnancy, um, resulting in the, this syndrome, this dysfunction um, when a child is born. Um, so fetal alcohol syndrome is characterized by craniofacial abnormalities. Um, so this includes things like low set ears, um, lacking the um, ridge that we'll see between the nose and the mouth, etc. So there are a number of those, um, but it's also characterized by learning disabilities and a low IQ um, and also neurological, functional and structural abnormalities. So as a result of some of the neurological abnormalities that we discussed in the previous slide, people with fetal alcohol syndrome um, have a number of behavioural issues associated with the disorder. Um, and this includes poor impulse control and also an impaired judgment. In the general population, for every thousand people, between two and seven people will have some form of fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, so it's a very small number in the general population. However, they are vastly overrepresented in the criminal justice system. And one study found that people with fetal alcohol syndrome are 19 times more likely to be incarcerated in any given year than somebody without fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, so we can see that there is a huge comorbidity with fetal alcohol syndrome and criminality. However, we also have to be careful here um, because some of the issues, some of the intellectual disabilities um, and behavioural issues that are associated with fetal alcohol syndrome also um, can result in somebody that has not necessarily committed any crime to be incarcerated um, for a crime. So um, people with fetal alcohol syndrome um, are much more likely um, to admit to things that they haven't done, um, they have diminished capacity, so they might confuse fact and fiction and make false confessions, etc. Um, so we still have to be careful um, with the data, but even with that, we can see they are vastly overrepresented. So the final environmental factor that we'll talk about that contributes to the likelihood of one becoming involved in criminality is association with deviant peers. Um, so this is a really obvious one. Um, if you hang out with people that are um, involving themselves in crime, you yourself are much more likely to be participating in that crime. Um, so this idea of being told by your parents, you know, don't hang out with the bad crowd, it's a real thing. Um, so if you're Spending time with people that are um, involving themselves in various forms of criminality, you yourself are not only learning um, how to um, solve problems through crime, um, but you're also involved in group pressures, um, which can have huge effects on people's behaviour. Um, so studies have shown that the majority of crimes committed by teenagers will occur in groups. Um, so... Association with deviant peers is actually one of the biggest predictors of participation in antisocial behaviour and acts. Um, so it's a much bigger predictor of criminality than a lot of the things that we've already discussed today. So it comes across as really simple. Don't hang around with a bad crowd, um, but it is not heeded by many people. So think about that one next time you go back to school. Um, so just to finish the section um, on the different factors that increase one's likelihood of becoming involved in criminality, um, I'm going to talk about the interaction of these various factors, um, the interaction of nature factors and the interaction of nurture factors. Um, so you've heard me talk about already um, throughout the other slides, that each of these factors only has an incremental increase in your likelihood of becoming involved in crime. Um, so they're all on their own, have very small effects. Um, and if you have one of these factors, or even two of these factors, it isn't something that's go that predicts you, um, that means you're going to go on to commit a crime. That isn't the case. 
how it's when these factors come together and interact with one another um, that it significantly increases your likelihood of criminality. So as an example, I'm going to use the low activity MAOA gene and an experience of childhood maltreatment. So these two risk factors interact with one another to increase the risk of criminality above that of the sum of both risk factors in isolation. Um, so what this means is if you have a low MAOA gene, that may increase your risk of becoming involved in criminality by a factor of one. Um, if you on your own, on its own, have childhood maltreatment as a risk factor, this might increase your risk factor of becoming involved in criminality um, by a factor of three. However, if you experience both low MAOA gene activity and childhood maltreatment, it doesn't increase your risk factor of criminality by four. It might increase it by 10. Um, and that is the interaction effect. When they're both there together, it can make a much larger impact than either of them in on their own. Um, the interaction effect can work in a positive manner as well. Um, so if somebody has a risk factor that increases their chance of criminality, another factor such as a positive maternal attachment might counteract this. So it does work in both directions. So as we come to the end of the lecture, I just want to reflect on some of the things that I spoke to you about at the very beginning, which was about why do we care? Why do we care where um, these things come from? Why do we care if it's a nature or a nurture effect? And um, what are the things, um, why do we care about why people um, or how people may become more likely to become involved in criminality? Um, well, the answer to that is, as I said before, um, if we understand how these things work better, then we hopefully can manipulate them, um, creating better outcomes. Um, in the case of um, criminology, um, less, um, cr less crime, less people being incarcerated, and a better society. Um, so given the things that we've talked about in this session, I'm inviting you to have a think about some of these questions, um, some policy implications, um, given what we've already discussed. Um, questions like, should we be putting people in prisons? Um, if we've looked at the fact that some of the factors um, that might increase their chances of criminality are outside that person's control. What should we be focusing on in prisons? Should we be focusing on punishment or should we be focusing on rehabilitation? Um, what could we do if, or what should we do, sorry, if we know somebody has many risk factors for criminality but hasn't yet committed a crime? Um, it's a difficult one because um, you can't infringe on somebody's rights. They've done nothing wrong yet. We know that they've got a much higher likelihood than somebody else. What do we do with that information? Um, and as well, should somebody with many risk factors for criminality be considered responsible for their criminal activity? Um, there are no right or wrong answers to this. Um, I'm not trying to lead you in any particular direction. It's just these are the kind of things that you can question when you have more information um, as we do um, from this lecture. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope you got something out of it and that you're interested in criminology um, and particularly interested in psychology. Um, have a lovely day.